Welcome everyone to STI's presentation, MIPS, the Quality Performance Category. My name is Karen and I will be your host today. Please note that the content is based on the proposed rule and is subject to change with the final rule, which is scheduled to be released on November 1st. Today, I'll provide a general overview of MACRA and the Quality Payment Program. If you attended our Introduction to MIPS webinar, welcome back. We do appreciate your attendance. This will be a review of that material, but I do have some new information to share. For those who missed our Introduction webinar, this will provide a foundation to help you understand the new Quality Payment Program with the focus on MIPS. I'll cover eligibility a clinician's composite performance score and the impact that has on your payment adjustments, plus the timeline of events. The quality performance category is replacing PQRS and is one out of the four performance categories of MIPS. It is worth 50% of a clinician's composite score, making it an excellent place to start when thinking about how to succeed in MIPS. I will compare the requirements of PQRS program to the quality performance category. There are several similarities, but some key changes to reporting on quality measures under MIPS. We'll also be looking at scoring and your submission options. MACRA, which stands for Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, was signed into law on April 16th of 2015. It repeals sustainable growth rate methodology. It created new quality payment programs, MIPS, which stands for Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, and APM, Alternative Payment Model. It also combines existing quality reporting programs into the new payment system. PQRS, Medicare's Meaningful Use, and the value-based modifier program are the current quality programs that are being rolled into MIPS. Their last performance year is 2016. So continue with your participation in PQRS until the end of the year to avoid negative payment adjustments in 2018. If this is your first year participating in Medicare's Meaningful Use Program, your reporting period is 90 continuous days. Attestation deadlines are October 1st of 2016 to avoid 2017 and 2018 payment penalties. Or you must attest by February 28th of 2017 to avoid the 2018 penalty. All returning participants must report on a full calendar year and your attestation deadline is February 28th, 2017, to again avoid the 2018 payment penalties. Please note that Medicaid EHR incentive program will continue beyond 2016. There is still incentive money available. Check your local state health department for the details of this year's requirements and the attestation deadlines, since every state is different. Any payment adjustment under PQRS Medicare's Meaningful Use and the Value-Based Modifier Program will end at the close of 2018. MACRA introduces us to two new quality payment programs, MIPS and APM. Again, MIPS has four performance categories, quality, advancing care information, clinical practice improvement activities, and resource use. Alternative payment models include the comprehensive end-stage renal disease care model, Medicare's shared saving program, next generation ACL, comprehensive primary care plus, and patient-centered medical home model. The law provides for continued development of alternative payment models, making more available for providers to participate in future years. Here are some additional key facts on advanced APM. Participants must use certified EHR technology. The quality measures are comparable to those in the quality performance category of MIPS. 
and an APM either one bears more than nominal financial risk for monetary losses or is a medical home model expanded under CMMI authority. Please note that MACRA does not change how any particular APM functions or rewards value. Instead, it creates extra incentive payments for APM participation. CMS does anticipate that the majority of eligible clinicians will fall under the MIPS track. Clinicians who are qualified participants in an advanced APM will be excluded from MIPS. CMS has proposed that they will notify the public of which APMs are considered advanced APMs prior to the performance period. This information will be posted on their website. Under MIPS, providers are referred to as eligible clinicians and applied to those professionals who bill Medicare Part B services. For the first two performance years, starting 2017 to 2018, this would include MDs, DOs, dentists, dental surgeons, podiatrists, optometrists, chiropractors, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and certified registered nurse anesthetist. The secretary may broaden this list by the third year to include physical and occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, audiologists, nurse midwives, clinical social workers, clinical psychologists, dietitians, as well as other nutritional professionals. CMS has proposed that clinicians who are not MIPS eligible can voluntarily report on applicable measures and activities specified under MIPS, giving them the opportunity to gain experience in the program, but you will not be subject to the MIPS payment adjustment. There are three groups of professionals who will not be subject to MIPS. First, if it is their first year of Medicare participation, Newly enrolled clinicians will only be excluded for the first performance year. If you enroll in Medicare in 2017, your performance year will be deferred until 2018, and your MIPS payment adjustments would then begin in 2020. Second, qualifying participants in an advanced APM will receive a bonus payment for their participation, and therefore they will not be subject to MIPS. And third is if you meet the criteria of the low volume threshold, which is defined as Medicare Part B charges less than or equal to $10,000, and you see fewer than 100 Medicare beneficiaries within your performance period. You must meet both the dollar amount and the number of patients. So if in 2017, you've seen 85 Medicare beneficiaries, but the sum of your allowable charges equal $13,000, you will not meet the low volume threshold. Therefore, you will be subject to meet the requirements of MIPS to avoid the negative payment adjustments in 2019. MIPS does not apply towards hospital or facility charges. This slide provides a breakdown of the weight of each category and a brief summary of scoring. I want to emphasize the weight of the categories as it contributes to a clinician's performance composite score. The quality performance category, again, is replacing peak QRS, and it's worth 50% of your score. Advancing care information replaces meaningful use, and it's worth 25%. Clinical practice improvement activity is new on a national level. CPIA is an activity that is identified as improving clinical practice and care delivery that will likely result in improved patient outcomes. The category is worth 15% of your composite score. And the last category is resource to use, which is replacing the physician value-based modifier and is worth 10%. These percentage weights are for 2017 and will change in future years. For example, the resource use category will be at 30% of a clinician's composite score in the third year of the program, with the remaining categories adjusted to equal 100%.
Your payment adjustment percentage is based on the relationship between your composite performance score and the NIPS performance threshold. Your composite score is the total points you receive on the activities for each performance category. Composite scores below the threshold will yield negative payment adjustments, and composite scores above will yield neutral or positive payment adjustments. Composite scores less than or equal to the 25th percentile of the threshold will yield the maximum negative adjustment for that year. So for the performance year of 2017, the maximum would be at negative 4% applied to your 2019 reimbursement. The example here shows the breakdown of points received for each performance category giving the eligible clinician a total of 85 points. Compared to the performance threshold at a hypothetical 60 points, puts them above the threshold, therefore the clinician would receive a positive payment adjustment. NIPS is budget neutral. The formula to maintain neutrality is three times the year's percentage rate. So, for 2017, the clinician could receive up to a possible 12% in positive payment adjustments due to budget neutrality. Budget neutrality works by taking the difference that was not paid to those receiving negative payment adjustments and redistributing that money to those receiving positive adjustments. Here is a timeline showing how the payment adjustment percentage will increase each year. The budget neutrality factor does remain. Budget neutrality only impacts positive payment adjustments, not negative. Eligible clinicians who perform exceptionally well could earn an additional bonus. Those eligible clinicians who rank in the top 25th percentile above the threshold could earn up to an additional 10%. This is new. CMS released a brief statement on September 8th stating that they are proposing to give eligible clinicians the option to select their performance period. MIPS will still begin January 1st of 2017. The first option is Test the Quality Payment Program. This is designed to ensure that your system is working and that you are prepared for broader participation in 2018 and 19 as you learn more. As long as you submit some data, you will avoid a negative payment adjustment. The second option, participate for part of the calendar year. This means your first performance period could begin a little later than January 1st, and your practice could still qualify for a small positive payment adjustment. The third option, participate for a full calendar year. This option is as the original proposal stated, requiring that you report on a full calendar year starting January 1st. The fourth option applies to those who participate in an advanced APM in 2017. More details on these performance period options will be released in the final rule. You can report as an individual or as a group. The key point is that you must use the same identifier for all performance categories. There are various methods you can choose to submit your data for the three performance categories, quality, advancing care information, and the clinical practice improvement activity. The resource use category is calculated based on the claims you submit. The key point is that you can only use one submission method per category. Here are some key events, most I have mentioned, except for the performance feedback reports. 
you will report your you will receive your first feedback report in July of 2017 and then a second report in July of 2018. These reports will, rep will reflect your performance on quality and cost measures similar to the QRUR report. Moving on to the quality performance category. I would like to highlight a few key differences between the current PQRS program versus the new MIPS quality performance category. Under PQRS, you must report on nine measures, which span across three different domains. One must be cross-cutting measure if you are patient-facing. PQRS defines a patient-facing clinician as having just one face-to-face -face encounter within the provider's reporting period. Telehealth service is considered non-patient-facing, and PQRS takes the all-or-nothing approach. In other words, if you fail to report one cross-cutting measure and you are a patient-facing physician, but you fulfilled all other requirements, you will automatically receive the 2018 payment penalty. Under MIPS quality category, they have reduced the number of required measures to six. One must be an outcome measure or high priority measure if an outcome measure is not available for your specialty. You must report one cross-cutting measure if you are patient-facing. Selecting measures based on domains is not required. The criteria for patient-facing has changed to greater than 25 encounters within your reporting period. And telehealth services has also changed to be recognized as patient-facing. The all-or-nothing approach has been dropped, allowing you to receive credit on what measures you have done, even if you do not meet all the full requirements. A cross-cutting measure is one that addresses common healthcare practice. CMS will publish a list of face-to-face -face encounter codes on their website, similar to the way they do for PQRS. CMS proposes to include telehealth services in the definition of patient-facing encounters. Various MIPS eligible clinicians use telehealth services as an innovative way to deliver care to beneficiaries, and they believe these services, while not furnished in person, should be recognized as patient-facing. Non-patient-facing is defined as an individual or group that bills 25 or fewer patient-facing encounters during the reporting period. Ten of the 23 current PQRS cross-cutting measures will, will remain as cross-cutting measures under MIPS. The remaining 13 are proposed to be available as individual quality measures for MIPS reporting. The example, diabetes hemoglobin A1C poor control. Under 2016 PQRS reporting, this measure type is a cross-cutting measure. But under 2017 MIPS reporting, this measure will be recognized as an intermediate outcome measure. Here's a list of the 10 cross-cutting measures for MIPS. You can review the full description of the measures in Table C of the proposed rule. Again, you must report one if you are patient-facing eligible clinician. One outcome measure is required to be reported by all eligible clinicians. CMS does recognize that they do not have enough outcome measures to support all specialties and subspecialties. Therefore, if an outcome measure is not available, you would report on one high priority measure. High priority measures are those that address appropriate use, patient safety, efficiency, patient experience, and care coordination. Many measures are identified as intermediate outcomes and will be considered as an outcome measure for the purpose of MIPS scoring. 
Unfortunately, CMS does not provide a table-friendly list of outcome measures. You will find outcome measures within the individual measure list in Table A of the proposed rule. I've gone ahead and listed all outcome and intermediate outcome measures here in slides 24 and 25 for you to reference to. For a full description of these measures, please see Table A. This is just a continuation of the list of outcome measures available for MIPS. Again, all eligible clinicians must report on one outcome measure if available. If not, then you will have to choose another high priority measure. When selecting measures, you can choose from the individual measure list, Table A in the proposed rule, or refer to the specialty measure set available in Table E. The measures within the specialty measure sets are the same ones you will find in the individual list of measures. They have just been sorted by the American Board of Specialty Standards. You will note that measure sets will vary in the number of measures they contain. If a measure set does not have enough measures to support the required number, you must then report on all measures available within the set, plus a cross-cutting measure if you are patient-facing to satisfy the requirements of the quality category. Here is a list of the specialty measure sets. I have noted how many measures are available within each set, and those sets marked with the asterisk do not contain any outcome measures, but do have high priority measures for which you can select to meet the requirements. To see what individual measures fall within the set, please refer to Table E in the proposed rule. is converted to points on a scale from 1 to 10. You will receive a zero for any required measure that is not reported. You can receive bonus points for additional outcome and or high priority measures. Two points are awarded for additional outcome measures and one point for high priority measures. Plus you will receive one additional point for each measure reported through your EHR. You take the total number of points you receive and divide it by the total number of possible points to achieve your final total. And here's a, an example of the quality scoring. Just a couple of additional things that I would like to point out. So here, take note to measure one. It is an outcome measure which is required. Therefore, you do not get the additional um, points for reporting. Please note that the number of cases, you need a minimum sample size of at least 20 cases. If we look down at measure number five, that is an additional high priority which addresses patient safety, and therefore this clinician did get the additional one point. Unfortunately, the cross-cutting measure which is required if you are patient-facing, was not reported. And therefore, they got a zero for their performance. However, the total possible points of 10 still counted. The three measures that are highlighted in yellow are population measures. Now, I didn't mention these before because this information is pulled from the claims that you submit. I just want you to be made aware that these three measures will contribute to your quality score. And again, as you know, for the acute composite measure, there was um, insufficient sample size, so therefore it was not held against them. You take the total number of points that you achieved and divide it by the total possible points to come up with your final quality score. Again, there are multiple methods to submit your quality data, but remember, you can only choose one mechanism per category.
And just a few additional notes before we wrap it up. The majority of the quality measures used in PQRS will be available under MIP in the first year of the program. An annual list of measures will be available before November 1st, prior to each performance year. If you would like to do some pre-game planning using the tables in the proposed rule, please double back to confirm the measures you selected are good to go when the final lists are made available. If you are planning to continue to use the measures you are currently reporting to PQRS, please make sure that the measures are still valid under MIP. Several measures will be retired, or their measure type may change, as we discussed earlier with the cross-cutting measure. Take note if the description of the measure is still the same. Some are proposed to change the age range, as with the example here. When selecting measures, do not shy away from reporting on the additional outcome or high priority measures. Not only will you receive additional points, but CMS proposes to increase the number of required outcome measures in future years. And last, be mindful of the submission method for each measure you select. Some measures can only be submitted through one mechanism. And again, you can only report your measures through one method. This brings us to the end of the presentation. I have listed our upcoming MIPS webinars here. Next, we will be covering the advancing care information category and then move on to the clinical practice improvement category and finishing out the year with the resource use category. Please go to our website to register for these webinars if you have not already done so. Thank you. That concludes our presentation.